When I described the chess table I was commissioned to make to a couple of woodworking friends of mine, they both had the same response. Ambitious. I've been woodworking since 2019, and this is actually my first time building a table. It also happens to be my entry into the 2023 Rockler Try That Challenge. Ever since I built my first chessboard for my family, I've been wanting to build another one. Preferably for someone who'd pay me to do it. Now I've been given that opportunity, and I couldn't be more excited. During the global pandemic, my family was binge-watching The Queen's Gambit on Netflix. Remember that one? It sparked a lot of new interest in the game of chess, my family included. After playing a few games on a vinyl roll-up board, my daughter said to me, you should build a chess board. And my response was, yes, I should. I was super proud of what I was able to make, and it only took me about a month and a half to complete. I brought that board to a holiday craft fair last December, not to sell, but to showcase the kind of work that I can do. A lot of people were admiring it, and some asked how much it would be to build another one. I didn't have a solid answer for that. About six or seven months after that craft fair, I was getting caught up on notifications on my Facebook page when I spotted a comment someone had made on a picture of that chessboard that I had posted like a year and a half prior. The comment read, how much would it be to make one of these for us? I don't check my notifications for my business page very often because I just don't have that many followers and I don't post there very often. So I easily could have missed this comment. So I messaged the lady who left the comment, we'll call her Kelly, and asked for her phone number so we could have a conversation about it. She obliged and I called. She said that she and her husband, we'll call him David, had seen my chessboard at the craft fair last winter and he was saying that was his dream board. Turns out David is a huge chess enthusiast. He even started a chess club in a neighboring town. Kelly said she'd like to surprise her husband for Christmas with a board like the one I'd made. I said good, because it's going to take me a while to build it. I was glad for the long lead time. I was also honored to be part of this wife's generous and thoughtful gift to her husband. We settled on a price, and she sent me a deposit. I then came back to her with a question. Is there a set of chessmen that you'd want this built around? Because I could match it for color and size. She said, oh, good question. Because they have several sets. Let me get back to you on that one. She later came back and said, I spilled the beans and spoiled the surprise because I just want him to be happy with his gift and I don't know which set he'd want to use. So now he's super excited that this board is coming his way. So excited, in fact, that he went out and bought yet another set of chessmen, especially for this project. I'm not going to tell you what he spent on those chess pieces, but I'll put a link in the description to the website where he got them from. A few days later, she messaged me again and asked, what if we put legs on it? I said, well, that's a whole other type of project, but sure. So I sent them my ideas for a chess table. They approved and sent me a deposit. It was around that same time that I took on another commission project. And because Christmas was months away, I started on the other project first. I'm a solopreneur with a small shop in my basement and a full-time job. So when that project started stretching into September, I started getting a little nervous about not having started the chess table yet. So that got me thinking, you know how these YouTubers make it look like they build a piece of furniture in a weekend? I know that can't be the case. So I called up a couple of my favorite woodworkers and asked them. Hey Cam, thanks for calling me back. Hey, I got a question for you. How long does it usually take you to build a project? Like number of shop hours or shop days? How long does one of my projects take me? That's a good question. Uh, obviously depends what I'm doing. I mean, the redwood there took longer than that little saw, right. but I would say usually 80-ish hours of work, and that's generally spread out over about eight to 12 weeks. So I could say three months, but it's really only about two weeks worth of work, Right. if that answers your question. Yeah. Nice shirt. Oh yeah, thanks. So I set that first project aside because it actually had no deadline and I got started on the chess table. It took me the better part of October to complete just the chessboard portion. I had to build that first because the rest of the table will be built around it. The board will also be removable in case David ever wanted to take it with him. Oh hey Chris, I wasn't sure if I was going to catch you on the first try. Hey Brett. Nice shirt by the way. 
Thanks. So how long does it take me to make a video? I think it's probably easiest to figure that out working backwards because I don't really know, but I work about 65 hours a week and it takes me about five weeks to put a video out. That's between building it, filming it, editing it, everything. So that's 325 hours. I would say during those five weeks, I probably goof around for about five hours a week, so minus 25. So I'd say it takes me about 300 hours to design something, build it, film it, edit it, the whole kit and caboodle. That is a nice shirt, by the way. Did I mention that? You did. Um, yeah, so that's your answer. Okay, well, I better get started on my chess table then. Hope that helps. Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. See you later. Pretty clean glue up, eh? On that first board I showed you, the corners got a little rounded with sanding. So to prevent that on this one, I put extra scraps around the board that were the same thickness. And that kept the edges nice and sharp. I hope it's not too soon to mention that I'm going to be using the proceeds from the sale of this chess table to finally create my website for my business. I've had the domain name brettsbasementwoodshop.com for a while, but I didn't have a website to attach it to. I'll be offering my design plans for this table on the website for anybody who'd be interested in building something similar. I'll have more details in the description to this video. My initial plan for the frame of this board was to do a sort of tongue and groove, but the mahogany I was working with was only an inch thick, which didn't leave much room to insert the substrate from the playing field. So I ended up resawing the mahogany and laminating it to some plywood to make the frame pieces thicker. Resawing also helped eliminate a pretty nasty twist in the mahogany. This veneer press came in really handy for this project. I used it in several of the glue ups to keep everything flat. The inlay around the playing field is made from tiger maple and paper stone. Have you ever heard of paper stone? I hadn't either. On my first chessboard, I was thinking ebony for the inlay, but when I found out how expensive ebony is, the guy at my local hardware dealer showed me this chunk of paper stone. And it's a lot like it sounds. It's made out of paper fiber and some sort of adhesive, and dye of course. It's super dense, super flat, and jet black. I only needed a little bit, so I'm ripping down some thin strips and then ripping those down even thinner. For the inlay and the edge banding, I'm using Tight Bond Extend. I hadn't used that type of glue before this project. It's really thin, almost like milk, or heavy cream maybe. The advantage is that it has a longer open time, hence the name Extend. And it also dries clear instead of yellow, and sands off pretty nicely. I think I used like five or six different types of glue in this project.
I was very careful to sneak up on the fit of these miters. Cutting a segment too short at this point would have been a disaster. For the frame glue up I used tight bond hide glue, another first for me, which looks exactly like caramel ice cream topping. I wonder what it tastes like. You'd think this video is sponsored by tight bond or something. I'm out here in the cold and the snow to talk about the sponsor for today's video. I'm just kidding. I don't have any sponsors. Let's get back in the shop. It's cold out here. Hide glue has several advantages over PVA glue. First is the long open time, and you can make that even longer by warming up the glue, but not above 150 degrees Fahrenheit. The second is that as it cures, it will actually pull the joint even tighter, which will help prevent against something called joint creep. Regular yellow wood glue or PVA glue retains some elasticity when it cures, which can allow joints to creep with seasonal wood movement. And possibly one of the best features is that it's repositionable. So even after it's fully cured, even years later, if you don't like how things came together, you can heat it up with a blow dryer or a heat gun and it'll release. So for that same reason, it's only good for indoor furniture. This stuff wouldn't hold up in the weather. Here are all of my tools of the trade for layout. I made five legs from this eight quarter cherry so I'd have one to practice on before cutting joinery in the real deal. Pretty smart if you ask me. Go ahead and ask me. Brett, do you think you're smart? My answer, yes. Yes I do. One of the best things about me is how humble I am. I should put that on a t-shirt. I like making up my own cliches. Okay, now I'm going to route a sliding dovetail mortise in the side of this practice leg so I'm making sure that I've got my setup correct. I'm so glad I made a fifth leg because I've been practicing on it and making sure that I've got my setup before I make these mortise cuts. And that has been 
really helpful. But before I use the dovetail bit, I'm going to first show this on the other camera. I'm going to first use a quarter inch spiral bit to go down the center of the mortise to kind of clear out some of the material. That way the dovetail bit doesn't have to work as hard and it'll give me a cleaner cut. I did the same thing over on the router table. I cleared out the bulk of the waste with the spiral bit before coming back with the dovetail bit. Such a satisfying wood on wood sound. To make sure there wouldn't be any gap in the end of the sliding dovetail, I cut a shallow shoulder about an eighth of an inch. Good. This is my first time using my tenoning jig. A lot of firsts for me in this build. The directions say to use a spacer the same thickness as the base plate to raise the workpiece above the surface of the saw table. But as you'll soon see, that introduced a variable I wasn't used to working with. See if you can spot what I did wrong. And I don't mean the little chip of wood that was keeping the skirt from sitting flat against the table. I didn't see that either till just now. Obviously. I made at least six cuts with the miter gauge before I noticed. Watch for the double take. Right there. Did you see it? Watch the rest of this video closely to see if you can figure out what I did to fix it. I'm not going to point it out. I was actually too embarrassed to film the fix. Why did you do that? But that's my big woodworking tip. Make sure you mill up extra pieces in the beginning, just in case something goes wrong. 
probably won't happen for you, but... So now you've got round mortises and square tenons. You can cut your mortises square with a chisel, but it's much quicker and easier to round the tenons off with a rasp. Time for a dry fit. This tapering jig is fun to use. Just remember to stay out of the path of things flying back at you. Let's watch that again in real time. I use the offcut to keep the legs steady when making the second taper. Once again, I'm using hide glue. In fact, I used hide glue exclusively in the rest of the table. sick. I really don't feel good. But I don't have time to be sick. This is a Christmas present. I don't have time for a haircut. I did take a shower today though because I like to smell good for my videos.
Now I'm getting set up to route the mortises for the floating tenons in each of these miter joints on the tabletop. So this is a little mortising jig that I've made to help me with that. So when I'm setting up the router, I'll use these stop locks on the router base to give me a start point and an end point of each mortise. And then once I have that set, I just leave that set up and just move my workpiece to center on the next mortise hole. So eight different setups for 16 mortises. So the, the setup is a little bit longer, but I tell you what, I didn't spend $1,200 making this. If you wanna see how I made this jig, I have a video that is dedicated to that. So let's see how it works. I'm going to clad the player side in leather and under the leather I'm going to put a layer of felt just so there's a little bit of cushion. So obviously those have a thickness to them and right now these two pieces are flush with each other but I need to plane the player side down to accommodate for the thickness both above and below. So I cut my mortises first so that I could match up everything really well and now I need to reduce the thickness of these two pieces to accommodate for the felt and the leather. This is an adhesive that I bought at the leather store. It's similar to contact cement in that you apply it to both surfaces and allow it to dry till tacky and then stick them together. What I like about this white stuff though is that unlike contact cement, it cleans up with water, it's low VOC, and best of all, it's repositionable before it cures. I got a little impatient when doing this felt layer. I didn't give it time to fully dry and my fingerprints showed through. Hopefully that won't be seen through the leather. This was fun. This is my first time working with leather. I like it. I'll definitely use it again in other projects. See, you wouldn't be able to get away with that with contact cement. You'd be stuck with the first placement.
In keeping with the chest theme, I'm using contrasting woods and box joints on the drawers so there'll be a checker pattern in the corners. I know a lot of people would pull the sled back toward them and just keep the blade spinning while repositioning the piece, but to me it was more important to get the cleanest cut possible, so I let the dado blade come to a complete stop each time instead of pulling it back through, just in case something were to shift a little bit and loosen the joint. I'm not giving a tutorial on box joints here, there's plenty of great videos on YouTube already for that. But I will point out that after you cut the last notch on the first board, you flip it around so that the top of both pieces are facing the blade when you line them up against each other. That way, the top finger will fit perfectly in the top notch. Now to cut the dado for the divider, I'm sticking all the side pieces together with double stick tape. That way I can cut all the dados in one shot and I know they'll line up perfectly. Okay, this one didn't come together so good. Shouldn't be able to see light through your joint. But that's what I love about hide glue. Watch this. It was 40 degrees in my garage, so I heated up the wood with a heat gun before and after spraying on each coat of lacquer. Here's a moment of truth. These are the drawer runners. Damn what? Let's try it, bro. In order to make the drawer faces look like table skirts, I had to make them pretty thin. A bit too thin to take a screw from the back side. And I apologize, but I was getting a little impatient and time was running short. It's already December and I was hoping to be done with this project by now. So I didn't film my solution for joining the faces to the drawer boxes. But I can tell you about it. The double stick tape was so I could mark out the mounting holes and then I chiseled in shallow square holes 
just deep enough to fit a square nut for machine screws. And that worked. Applying an oil and wax finish is a bit of a pain on a project like this, but the results are so worth it. And as a side benefit, I had that lovely lemon scent from the Odie's oil lingering in my shop for a couple of days. Okay, this part is a lot of fun. It adds that extra level of luxury to the look and feel of the whole table. Each piece gets its own cozy little nesting place. What shall we do with a broken saw blade? What shall we do with a broken saw blade? What shall we do with a broken saw blade? Leave it in the comments. And you have to be careful which kind of adhesive you use. Most spray glues will melt foam. So you have to look for the kind that is safe to use with foam. And actually, I'd do this a little differently next time. The glue got a little heavy in some places and soaked through the fabric and stained it and made it a little crunchy when it dried. So I would still use the spray glue because you don't want the fabric slipping out of place. But instead of trying to get it deep into each spot, I would use something like carpet tape in the bottom of each piece to hold the fabric down and do a lighter coat of glue along the top. That way there wouldn't be any bleed through. I hope that makes sense. Instead of using Z-clips or those figure eight things, I chose to use buttons to hold the tabletop to the side skirts and the same threaded inserts and bolts on the underside of the leather armrests. I wanna give a huge shout out to Cam Anderson from Blacktail Studio and Chris Salamone from Four Eyes Furniture for their cameo appearances in this video and their words of wisdom. In the off chance that you don't know who they are, I'll leave links to both of their channels in the description. Thanks guys. Oh no. It doesn't fit out the door. Now what I'm gonna do. I was expecting to be over there. The lighting's better here. It is very, oh, it's very pretty. It's so pretty. I love it. Now you take it off. The bow? Take the bow off. You think? I can put it out. I got is, the tape off. very pretty. Okay, ready? Ooh, that's smooth. It is, it's pretty. It's very nice. Oh, it's like raised it. too, right here? Oh, there's drawers. That is the yeah, actually, you're right, buddy. Good job. It pops out. The whole chessboard comes out. Oh, does it? You have to kind of reach up under and push it up. So if you're ever like, you have to play for some reason. Oh, wow. Oh, that's actually really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Until next time, my friend, be safe and love each other.